podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. This is Rich Harper. We'll begin in about five minutes. Looking forward to it.
Hello and good afternoon, everyone. We're, for some of you, good morning. This is Rich Harper, Manager of International Trade for Outdoor Industry Association. Welcome to this webinar, uh, Managing Supply Chains in an Uncertain Trade Environment, New Sourcing Opportunities for Outdoor Products. Uh, again, my name is Rich Harper. I'm the Manager of International Trade. I'm normally based out of our home office in Washington, D.C., but doing this presentation from my home office in Bethesda, Maryland. Very happy to be joined by two of our longtime outside trade councils, Andrew Samet and Ron Serini from Serini Samet and Associates. Also happy to be joined by Emily Vita from Columbia Sportswear, an OIA member, and Emily's also a member of our Trade Advisory Council. Um, we're very happy to have you all join us uh, today. Uh, this is another one of our series of webinars um, on trade and sourcing opportunities. Um, just a little bit of background for those of you that may not be familiar uh, with OIA uh, in our trade program. Um, we represent a wide variety uh, of members from global brands uh, like Columbia uh, to small mom and pop shops on Main Street USA. Uh, the core of our trade program and the, the root of it is our balanced trade agenda. And this simply means that we support and advocate for the elimination of import tariffs on outdoor products where there is no viable domestic production. And for our main USA members, we support policies to help them compete uh, in a global economy. Um, ultimately, our goal is to ensure a stable, predictable environment uh, for US federal trade policy, which has certainly proved to be challenging uh, over the past three years. And we look to lower costs for outdoor uh, companies and consumers so we can get more people uh, outdoors. Uh, so today's webinar is based on ongoing issues related to the COVID-19 outbreak affecting many sourcing uh, countries for outdoor products, as well as we want to give an overview of the state of play uh, regarding uh, generalized system of preferences or GSP countries and uh, US uh, FTA partners or countries with whom the United States has a free trade agreement. So as outdoor companies are managing the challenges of COVID-19 and uh, the lingering effects of the U.S.-China trade war. We are understanding folks are looking for, you know, opportunities uh, outside of China. So we wanted to give an overview uh, of some of those uh, opportunities here today, as well as um, I'll get into a, a quick where we are now uh, with uh, the U.S.-China trade war. As always, at the end of the presentation, we'll have opportunity uh, for Q&A. And if you please use the chat feature uh, to ask your questions, we'll try to get to as many as possible uh, at the end of the, the presentation. But again, please use uh, the chat feature for any questions uh, you might have on uh, the presentation. So to kick things off, I did want to give an overview of where things stand uh, with the U.S.-China trade war. So in the four having to manage with the, the outbreak of COVID-19, outdoor companies were uh, faced with a challenge of punitive tariffs as a result uh, of the U.S.-China trade war. Um, just a quick background, uh, the administration launched an investigation early on in the president's term uh, to determine if uh, China's industrial policies were undermining U.S. IP, and the report concluded that, that those policies were, in fact, uh, undermining U.S. IP uh, and recommended that the president impose uh, punitive tariffs to address those issues and bring China to the table uh, to negotiate a comprehensive agreement. So since then, we've seen four rounds of punitive tariffs. Most outdoor products were initially hit uh, with a third list of tariffs and now facing 25% uh, punitive tariffs. And I'll get into some examples of the products on list three. Um, in addition, also a number of outdoor products hit on the so-called list 4A. Um, right now, at least in terms of additional tariffs, we're out of it of a ceasefire. The administration in China signed uh, the so-called phase one agreement in January that uh, stopped another round of tariffs on the so-called list 4B um, and also lowered uh, the punitive tariff on the 4A from 15 to 7.5%. The intent was that the two sides would then begin uh, negotiations on a so-called phase two agreement, a more comprehensive agreement uh, to address the more challenging issues, uh, including uh, removing all uh, punitive tariffs. Um, however, candidly, those negotiations really not really didn't get off the ground. Um, and to put it mildly, not just not least because of uh, the COVID-19 outbreak, um, the, the relations between the two sides are at a low. 
Um, so there has been no discernible progress towards a, a phase two agreement. And President Trump has, over the past few weeks, um, really signaled his unhappiness um, with, uh, with China. And we even saw one of his principal uh, advisors in the White House, Peter Navarro, uh, indicate that the phase one agreement was uh, was was no longer in play. Now he has since walked back uh, at those comments, um, but suffice to say, um, the two sides, the relations again are at an all-time low. And there has been no progress towards uh, a phase two agreement. Um, and this also uh, is it true that the Democrats and Republicans alike on Capitol Hill uh, are want the president uh, to remain uh, tough on China, and in thinking beyond November. I think it's important to keep in mind that even if with a, a Biden uh, administration, um, that these uh, punitive tariffs are likely to remain in place for the foreseeable future. So um, the Biden administration would still need to get something in return from China, some movement on some of those industrial policies that we believe have undermined US IP um, before the, the, those punitive tariffs can be lifted. Um, so we're advising companies to be aware of that, that these tariffs could remain in place for the foreseeable, likely we should say, remain in place for the foreseeable future. Um, so again, this is just an overview of the, the list three and the list four A products. This is list three, um, includes most backpacks, camp chairs, bikes, um, bike parts. These all face an additional 25% tariff. And list four, well, list four was split into to two parts. The, 4A uh, and 4B. 4A again was hit with initially with a 15% punitive tariff. That's now down 7.5. Outdoor apparel, footwear, some equipment, and the 4B, uh, which had been was slated to come into effect uh, last December, uh, has been uh, postponed. And that was an, another uh, group of apparel, footwear, and equipment. And I say postponed indefinitely, as I mentioned, with you know, relations at a low, it's always possible that the president could turn. Uh, to these, this group of tariffs again. So it's, it's always possible that another uh, group of product could face um, additional punitive tariffs uh, if the president decided to move forward uh, in that direction. Um, where we have seen some relief uh, with the U.S.-China trade war is through the exclusion process. So a number of OIA members have secured exclusions from uh, these punitive tariffs. Um, and as you, if you tuned into a previous webinar OIA and SSA did on this subject, any ex approved exclusion um, is available to any importer as long as th their product matches the product description uh, in the approved exclusion. So it doesn't have to be simply, be, it's not simply uh, related to the petitioner who filed it. So the administration set up this process um, that gave stakeholders the opportunity to file petitions and make the case that their product should be excluded from uh, the punitive tariffs. Um, the administration is now considering whether or not those exclusions should be renewed. Originally, they were approved for one year, um, so they've received comments on whether or not those um, those exclusions should be uh, renewed or extended for another year. Um, it, to be clear, the administration has been very stingy in extending exclusions um, uh, beyond the one year. So companies have had to demonstrate clear economic harm and a clear total lack of supply outside of China uh, to succeed. Um, and as we saw last week, um, the US Trade Representative, Ambassador Lighthizer, testified that really the intent of these exclusions were to give companies the time to find sourcing options uh, outside of China. So the chances uh, of some of these exclusions being extended are, are slim, but nevertheless, administration uh, is going through that process to consider whether or not uh, the exclusions from the first three lists uh, will be extended, and any exclusions exclusions from the 4A uh, will be considered uh, later this year. Another issue related to th 301 investigations that we did want to flag for everyone, uh, so this is outside of the, the China 301 tariffs, but it's a new uh, investigation under that same uh, section of uh, U.S. trade law. Um, in response to proposals to impose a tax on uh, digital service providers, the administration did launch an investigation uh, against France um, and found that the, the proposed digital services tax would discriminate against U.S. companies and proposed uh, punitive tariffs uh, in response. Um, those punitive tariffs were put on hold as long as the U.S. Uh, was negotiating with its partners in the 
Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development uh, on digital services taxes. Um, the two things to flag for you, the U.S. walked out of those negotiations. Our, the Secretary of uh, Treasury Mnuchin argued that the proposals um, made by our, our partners were unreasonable. Um, and the U.S. has, has also launched uh, investigations into other similar taxes uh, and a number of different uh, partners, Austri Austria, Brazil, Czech Republic, Indonesia, India, Italy, the European Union, and UK. Um, so following the same format as the, the China 301 investigations, it's possible the administration could conclude uh, that these digital services taxes uh, discriminate against US companies and could propose uh, punitive tariffs uh, in response. Um, so did want to flag that for everyone, uh, especially given the challenges uh, that companies have faced with the China 301 tariffs and for those companies looking at alternative options and looking at alternative sourcing de de destinations, you do want to keep in mind uh, that the administration is looking at uh, similar investigations um, related to the digital services tax. Um, so, but that's where we are with this administration that has shown that they uh, want to use punitive tariffs to address uh, public policy uh, issues. So something to keep in mind as you're looking at uh, different uh, sourcing um, options. Um, so with that overview, I wanted to turn it to uh, our, one of our outside trade councils, uh, Andrew Samet, uh, for a presentation on uh, COVID-19 and the impact on, on sourcing uh, countries. Uh, thank you, Rich. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, everybody, depending on where you are. Um, what I wanted to do is maybe in terms of COVID while you're looking at this first slide just to tell you that I want to cover basically four points uh, I think this first slide kind of helps us think about you know what has happened and the trends and the different actors more at the macro level I think Emily will will talk about this you know more from a company perspective but I want to we'll look at the different actors would include buyers and suppliers and uh, unions and NGOs, governments, uh, the international financial institutions, and international organizations. And I think w one thing that we can draw from all this is there really has been no coherent international response to to and for those key countries uh, that are that are vulnerable and dependent upon um, apparel, footwear and travel goods uh, for their for their economies uh, most of these key sourcing countries that we're talking about um, so uh, and then I want to touch on a few data points maybe of interest um, highlight a couple impacts and responses and uh, mention some of the some of the country uh, responses that we're aware about but again, it's important, I think, to recognize there's really been no international coordinated leadership on how to, to handle this. So as the slide shows, kind of think about it as, a, you know, there's a sort of a pre-crisis period that began um, in, you know, in, in January when uh, supply chain from China seemed to be interrupted. I call, you know, as I said, I kind of call that the pre-crisis period in January, February, then we moved into this cancellation crisis, you know, in March and April, and with lockdowns, uh, both in supplying countries as well as in obviously in the U.S., North America, and Europe. Uh, April and May, we kind of have a response period, um, and I'll talk more about that later. And then in, I guess May and June is sort of beginning to think about the recovery period. Um, but the, 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 obviously the vulnerability uh, continues here in, in uh, and as I said, without a coherent international plan, um, it's gonna be very ad hoc and difficult to anticipate everything and to respond to it as individual companies. So in terms of the next slide, um, Rich. Um, a, a few interesting data points, or maybe not so interesting, depending upon where you sit, is, as you know, uh, retail sales uh, recorded uh, record declines in March and April of 8.7 and 14.7 percent. The upturn in May was strong, and you recently heard about that, 16.8 uh, for 
uh, retail sales. Uh, but for clothing and accessory stores, sales were still 63% lower in May, in May 2020 compared to May 2019. And that's a slight, slight improvement from the 87% decline in April. But it shows that that, that recovery in retail is, is um, not uh, very robust uh, in the stores uh, that do um, apparel and accessories. And as you know, online sales continue to grow. And for May 2020, it was up 25% over 2019, a year prior. Um, the, the retail sales numbers, I won't go over these, but it's very similar in the EU uh, story as it is in the US. And some of the, the estimates out there by different organizations suggest uh, a year-on-year -year decline of somewhere between high 20s and 45%. So I guess if it's kept the low 20s, um, that will be a success uh, decline for, for this year compared to last, but that's a pretty bracing number. Um, next slide, Rich. Um, a couple of interesting things. When you look at apparel imports into the US, uh, the China number, um, year to date is down, and this is all apparel down 44%, or uh, this is census numbers. It's even a little bit higher on the Texan numbers. Um, and the decline for the, the overall is 20%. So China's declined dramatically uh, in this year to date. And obviously, that's the combination of um, both the COVID impact as well as the 301 impacts that, that you're all aware of. Um, kind of interesting to note, you know, Vietnam has kind of held its own, as has Bangladesh. Um, Indonesia and India, they've had sort of more lockdowns, so some decline. Um, Cambodia, interestingly, is up um, for the US uh, year to date. Um, and of course, Central American countries have been uh, down fairly significantly, again, uh, facing a number of lockdowns. Um, next slide, Rich. Uh, footwear, similar story with regard to China, uh, down a third this year, which is a little less than twice as much as the overall decline. Again, showing the combined impact of 301 and, and COVID. Uh, Vietnam up slightly, uh, as you can see, Indonesia down a little bit, and Cambodia sort of up significantly. Um, and uh, these reflect sort of broader trends, but also um, some of the the, the lockdown issues. Um, next slide, Rich. Uh, kind of switch now to a few points about the, the, the impacts and uh, responses that have occurred from the different um, stakeholders in, in the industry. Um, obviously, we've talked about the, the significant decline in demand and the mandatory store closures, which have hit retail, um, canceled, canceled uh, payments to suppliers, uh, industry inventory buildup, Etc. Um, some estimates are suggesting store closures will hit. Uh, that should be 100,000 uh, total not, uh, by 2025. So, and you're well aware of the bankruptcy picture occurring. Um, there was major impact on the suppliers. Again, I think most of you are well aware of that. Basically, in terms of uh, liquidity crunch, that it also is being faced by lots of companies and retailers, but also the, the manufacturers, um, as well as um, the need to reduce workforce and, and wages. And in most of the countries that we're talking about, there's limited national capacity to address uh, those credit needs and the income losses. And of course, that results in um, increases in poverty, as well as uh, potential industrial relations problems, social unrest, unpaid wages, et cetera. Um, next slide, Rich. 
So in terms of some of the responses initially, uh, as many of you know, uh, there was a big press that brands, both US and European, uh, should pay for the in-process and completed orders. Um, the Worker Rights Consortium put together a sort of naughty and nice list tracker, which is still there, uh, depending upon the commitments made. Um, and um, NGO, there's pretty active NGO and trade union effort to uh, make sure that companies um, paid for the, the orders that had been provided. Um, that was kind of a, an immediate issue, but it really didn't address uh, the issue of orders that are forgone because of lack of, of demand um, and orders that were never placed. Um, the suppliers spent a lot of time and effort, as you know, making resonating that same demand for payment on orders. And there's been a lot of, we've heard a lot of discussion about uh, manufacturers now, you know, changing payment terms and wanting advanced payments, um, uh, given the experience uh, of this year. Uh, obviously, you all have your own experience with regard to that. As I said, um, some, of the net, some of the governments tried to come up with liquidity schemes, uh, social safety net schemes. Um, some, some did significant amounts on that, but many don't have the capacity or the ability to do it effectively. Um, some have initiated some broader competitiveness reforms and some accepted some bilateral development aid um, to help with income support uh, for, the, for the factories, but that was pretty, pretty marginal um, assistance when you look at the overall needs. Next, next slide, Rich. Um, and that's resulted in, you know, so depending upon the country, um, some, some unrest, some pressure campaigns. Um, and I think what's more going to be long lasting is these demands for social security funding mechanisms, which will be a new uh, obligation being addressed to, to uh, buyers um, in the supply chain. Uh, as I said, there's really been no effective coherent international response to this. But um, one thing that did come together in April was this ILO call to action, which was largely a European driven effort, but there's some US companies that have signed on to that. Um, and it was an effort to sort of call, call for internet, some international coherence, but uh, the international coherence would have to really be driven by uh, the G7 governments uh, working with um, the World Bank, IMF, et cetera, and that doesn't really seem to have um, gotten traction. So I don't think there'll be an immediate impact from this ILO initiative, but the longer term impact on the global agenda setting is the idea now, you know, adding to the responsibilities of companies um, that there's got to be a social so security cost, um, meaning pensions, unemployment, healthcare, et cetera, have to be factored into the supply chain costs. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's a responsibility also of buyers to, to address that. Um, the, the World Bank and the IMF and the Asian Development Bank all made large announcements and commitments of funding, but there's very little of that that passes through that you can tie directly to um, the liquidity needs of the factories in the sector and um, direct income support for, for the workers in the sector. Not that they're not doing some important things, obviously, on the, the healthcare side and providing government uh, uh, liquidity for other programs. But for the most part, we haven't heard that those programs are being, um, being uh, attached directly to, uh, to the sector. Uh, and in those countries that are that are important sourcing countries and that are vulnerable. I think I'm going to largely stop there. There's a few subsequent side slides, uh, Rich, that you can, you know, sort of move through relatively quickly. These slides sort of indicate to you, um, you know, some of the key points 
uh, for uh, countries in the different regions um, that we know about in terms of the impact of factory closures, workforce layoffs, what programs may have been initiated. Um, and we track these for a number of people. And if, if, if you know, anyone's particularly interested in what we know or can find out about specific countries, um, but you can sort of go through the, the, the rest of the regions, you know, kind of quickly. So, so you know, we, we do it for Southeast Asia, South Asia, um, North Africa and, and the Middle East, and um, also for Central America and Haiti. So if, if anyone's particularly interested in specifics of what's going on, by all means, we're happy to talk to you further. But let me uh, stop there and turn it over to, to Ron. Thank you, Andrew. I thought I'm going to give a, a broad overview of the GSP program, some of the recent dynamics. Um, you know, until recently, GSP was a pretty predictable program. You knew what products were eligible, you knew what countries were eligible, and you could plan long term. Starting several years ago, there started to be a number of changes to the program, both on the negative and positive side. I, I don't recall, it was probably about six, seven years ago when Bangladesh, for example, um, was taken out of the program. Um, and that was, I think, the first major GSP recipient that was made de-eligible. Uh, many OIA members use the program today for primarily travel goods type products, so backpacks, um, uh, backpacking tents, hydration packs, et cetera. And it would be good to know, by the way, from, from all of you on this, uh, webinar and other OI members what you might be using the GSP program for. Um, the current program is set to expire at the end of the year on December 31st. Um, unfortunately, if passed this prologue, it will expire, and we do think the odds are pretty high it will expire for a short term. If you look at the pre previous reauthorizations in 2011, 15, and 18, they did expire for various periods of time and then made retroactive, which meant that uh, importers who had to pay duties during that gap were reimbursed. Um, thus far this year, Congress has taken absolutely no action um, in, in moving forward for reauthorization at GSP. There's been no congressional hearings. There's been no legislation introduced. Um, and that's a bit concerning because this is an election year and there's a very limited number of legislative days left between now and the election. So we have to hope that um, there's a lame duck session of Congress after the elections, in which case GSP might be able to be renewed then, more likely than not, as I said, for various reasons, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, the odds are that it will expire and be revisited next spring. Um, you know, again, it passed the prologue, if it expires and made retroactive, um, it would be made retroactive and, and you'd get reimbursed. I'm not sure in this environment we can necessarily count on that. I think it's likely that GSP benefits would be made retroactive, um, but you know we just have to watch it closely and that's something, you know, OA will be very engaged on that point and others and, and so should all of you. Um, Rich, next slide. Um, you know, as I mentioned, that travel goods was a big success. In the, in the 2015 uh, trade bill, we were able, to, for the first time, to do a major expansion, product expansion of the GSP program. Um, the ex other exclusions currently are apparel and footwear. Uh, travel goods, as, as I said, was exempt up until then. We've seen, uh, since the incorporation of GSP, uh, I'm sorry, in incorporation of travel goods into GSP, a large shift of production out of China. Um, exports from China from 2015 to 2019 dropped from $7.2 billion in overall travel goods to $4.5 billion, while GSP countries increased, as has Vietnam. Vietnam, like China, is not a uh, eligible country under the GSP program. Um, for travel goods, uh, the increase was pretty dramatic from $580 million up to nearly $2 billion. We think that's going to continue to accelerate because there were capacity limitations in GSP eligible countries, which are now coming on stream. Some people are converting apparel plants and, and, and are bringing in new additional um, manufacturing. 
Um, and backpacks alone, we saw a pretty dramatic increase from $65 million to $300 million. So again, we expect those trends to continue. Um, next slide, Rich. You know, as I said at the beginning, it used to be pretty easy to to develop a sourcing strategy around GSP. Now you really have to follow the program very, very carefully. And OI has been great about getting out alerts to members and staying engaged with Congress and the administration to make sure that you all have the very latest information. Um, some of the recent changes under the Trump administration, which is increasingly using the GSP program as leverage to get concessions from our trading partners rather than just simply provide unilateral benefits without um, uh, asking for concessions in return. Um, the U.S. has now started to, to use it as leverage. Um, in, Tur uh, in the case of Turkey, um, the administration fully graduated Turkey from the program and we don't see any prospect of them being reinstated. Um, after substantial discussions with India, the U.S. also suspended them from the program. Um, and that's in a pretty, they were a fairly major beneficiary of the GSP program. There have been and are active discussions with India uh, to potentially reinstate them in the program. And I think I'll talk about that just a little bit later. Uh, Thailand, which is a great example, there were trade issues and labor issues with Thailand, um, which uh, resulted in a negotiation between the United States and Thailand. OIA was very engaged in that effort, um, and we knew that a substantial part of uh, exports from Thailand to the U.S. were in jeopardy of losing GSP. Um, we made a strong case to USTR that this is not the time to revoke GSP duty-free benefits on travel goods, given what's going on with China and the trade war there, and the fact that travel goods is a relatively new addition to the GSP program, um, and therefore, you know, we don't want to penalize companies trying to do the right thing and reposition their manufacturing out of China. Um, and, and again, here I would alert folks to re focus on these issues sooner rather than later, because I think there were also some lost opportunities with Thailand. We found out only after the program expired that some OIA members were importing products under GSP, um, and they were unfortunately revoked those products. If we had known that, if Rich had known that uh, prior to the, exp uh, the revocation and while there was an open comment period, I think we could have preserved most, if not all, of those products. Um, there are other ongoing investigations still under the GSP program, some with countries that are probably not very um, uh, interesting for you from a sourcing perspective, but others like Indonesia are clearly very important. Um, Rich, next slide. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, the negotiations with India have been kind of off, on again, off again. Um, at one point, USTR was was fairly bullish that they would be able to reach an agreement that would have reinstated uh, India's GSP eligibility for at least some, if not all, products, and they were hopeful that it would reinstate GSP on all products. Um, then India passed a uh, digital services tax, which is put a big damper on those negotiations. So we do not see any prospect in the near term um, for reinstating uh, GSP, although President Modi and President Trump have a pretty good relationship and both presidents do wanna have those negotiations ongoing. There's been an, uh, an active review going on for some time with Indonesia. Um, the sense we're getting from US government officials is that in, uh, Indonesia has engaged in a very productive manner and has addressed most, if not all, of the U.S. concerns. So we, while there's still parts of those investigations that are ongoing, we are pretty confident that uh, India will, Indonesia will remain eligible for uh, GSP for all products. Um, Thailand, I mentioned earlier that there was a partial revocation at GSP. Um, there are still ongoing discussions with Thailand that uh, could reinstate the products that were lost. Thailand has provided uh, some additional market access, but on things like um, pork, where they're failing to give the U.S. additional access, that's that's been an obstacle to um, reinstating uh, 
all products into GSP for Thailand. Um, next slide, Rich. Um, fairly recently on June 17th, Ambassador Lighthizer um, testified before the Ways and Means and Finance Committees. Andrew, I think, referred earlier to some of the things the ambassador said during those negotiations, uh, during those that testimony. Um, he um, he stated, you know, and that the U.S. has not been as good as the European Union is using the GSP program as leverage, and that he stated that's something that he would like to to do more in the future. Um, one big problem has been that we have granted unilateral benefits to some major countries, and we're not getting access in return. While those same countries, like South Africa, is a good example, has negotiated a full-fledged free trade agreement with the European Union. So exports from the EU into South Africa get preferential treatment while US products do not. And I think if there's a second term to the Trump administration, we'll see a greater emphasis on that part of it. Um, you know, at this stage, the, the MS Lighthizer said he wasn't, there was no official administration position on renewal of GSP that he would talk to the president about it. I personally am confident that they will support and want to see GSP um, renewed simply because it does give them some additional leverage um, in the program. Um, but, you know, folks in the House hoping that the democratically controlled House, that there'll be a new president, may want to defer renewal of the program um, till 2021 so that it's negotiated in the context of the new um, political configuration, if there is a new political configuration. Um, next slide, Rich. Presently, there are really two big, two broad issues that are affecting um, the renewal of GSP and is probably the reason why no bill has yet been introduced to reauthorize the program. Um, the first is there are some in Congress, mostly Democrats, but not only Democrats, that have raised concern about human rights issues and other issues and political issues in the Philippines and Cambodia. And we know some have said we should really um, revoke benefits for those countries. Others have said, you know, well, let's, let's at least add additional criteria so that we can file requests for investigations with countries like the Philippines and Cambodia, and which could lead to changes or revocation as it did in the case of India and partially in the case of Thailand. Um, some Democrats are uh, pushing for expanded criteria related to women's rights, for example, and as I mentioned, human rights and political. The second issue that somewhat influenced um, the lack of action is two major U.S. companies, The Gap and Nike, uh, have been lobbying to add all apparel and all footwear to the GSP program. Um, and while many of you and think that's a noble idea and it would certainly enhance the benefits of the program, they really walked into a big political buzzsaw, um, both from domestic manufacturers, such as U.S. footwear manufacturers and uh, domestic textile manufacturers like the Council of Textile Organizations. They've opposed uh, expanding uh, GSP to all apparel and all footwear. And a big part of the international community stepped up and opposed it. The African countries who benefit from AGOA, most of the Western Hemisphere, uh, Mexican producers, Central American producers, Colombia got very active saying, you know, if you add apparel to GSP and give duty free to major apparel exporters in Asia, it's going to wipe out the Western Hemisphere supply chain. So I think for that reason, it's not likely at all um, that Congress will act to add all apparel and all footwear uh, to GSP. <clears throat> Next slide, Rich. Um, that doesn't mean there's no opportunity to expand footwear. I mean, expand GSP to products like footwear. Um, the key to um, being successful is to be able to provide Congress with non-controversial alternatives. And one thing that's you know been inherent in OIA's um, principles on trade is to do no harm to domestic manufacturers. And that's why the OIA led effort to add um, travel goods to GSP was very successful, and that's why I think we'll have a really good chance of adding some footwear products 
to GSP programs. So again, here I would encourage um, everyone to be engaged and work with us and as we work with domestic manufacturers to see if we can develop, and I think we will develop a universe of products that will be non-offensive to domestic manufacturers, but yet provide real benefits to OI members. Our target right now is to have our OI uh, supporters on the Hill introduce legislation in the House and Senate in September. <clears throat> that, in our judgment, would still give us enough time to be able to amend the program when it's reauthorized uh, by Congress, whether it's in the lame duck session or next year. Um, and Rich, I think that's it. So I'm going to turn it back to Andrew. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention the, uh, uh, sorry, the, there is a number of free trade agreements that would encourage you all to look at. Um, I, there's a slide there that mentions with the countries. The only thing I'd alert you to is U.S. free trade agreements tend to have very different rules of origin in each agreement. So the devil's in the details and you want to make sure you uh, uh, understand those differences um, as you look for new sourcing supply. Sorry, Andrew, back to you. Okay, thanks, Ron. Um, yeah, this is just transitional from U.S. GSP to a few comments on the European GSP program. Uh, this slide just indicates that there are some differences in the eligibility criteria and and also on the scope of the programs. Um, and the um, key difference is most most U.S. GSP reviews have been for intellectual property and worker rights uh, considerations. Actually, the European Union has only recently begun to do any GSP review sort of based on criteria, although they have done GSP plus reviews uh, in the past. So I'll get into that distinction in a minute. But they include not just worker rights criteria, but also broader political and human rights uh, criteria, so uh, which are <laughs> reflected in those 15 conventions that they refer to in, in the eligibility of the program. Uh, next slide, Rich. So uh, the the EU program has uh, it, it, it has three baskets: the GSP standard, GSP plus, and everything but arms. Their MFN tariffs on the textile, clothing, leather, footwear uh, sectors range from, as you can see there, from two percent up to seventeen percent. And those benefits are uh, we are not are are complete for the everything but arms, which includes zero duties and quotas. Um, but for GSP standard, it includes um, duty reductions on 66% of tariff lines. Um, there are 15 beneficiary countries in that group. Uh, GSP plus, which gives you zero duties, but is based on a review of compliance with. A, uh, a number of international conventions. There are eight beneficiaries, and then everything but arms uh, is 48 beneficiaries. Um, the program, the current EU program, uh, is authorized through December 31st, 2023, and they're already undertaking their kind of review as to whether there should be modifications to that program. Um, next slide, Rich. Uh, this gives you the list of the countries uh, in the different eligibility. Um, of course, uh, key on everything but arms includes uh, Bangladesh, Cambodia, uh, Myanmar, particularly, um, and um, Haiti in this in this hemisphere. Um, next slide, Rich. Um, these the these are the specific countries in the standard agreement. Vietnam is in the in just the standard GSP, and of course, with it's going to have a free trade agreement come into force. It's now been approved by the European Union institution, so it should come into force in the next uh, couple months, and there'll be a phase out period, uh, a couple of years, uh, once they uh, once they do that from the GSP eligibility to the FTA eligibility. Uh, next slide, Rich. Um, that, these are the GSP plus countries, uh, which includes uh, Pakistan, the Philippines, and Sri Lanka. Um, next slide, Rich. 
and the EBA countries. Uh, Cambodia, I'll talk about. I'll talk about Bangladesh and Cambodia and Myanmar a bit more in a minute. But these obviously uh, very similar in the sense of the Adela program eligibility and and for a number of sub-Saharan African countries. But then there's uh, some for EBA, uh, including uh, the, those Asian supplying countries as well as Haiti. They're important. Next slide, Rich. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Cambodia, as I said, Bangladesh and Myanmar. Uh, some of you may have heard that Cambodia is uh, is liable right now to have a withdrawal uh, of one billion dollars of its uh, EBA eligibility to the European Union. That that includes about 20% uh, of the uh, apparel lines, 30% uh, of footwear. Um, and uh, all travel goods, and this comes to a little over a billion dollars. It includes a couple other things as well, but for our purposes, those are the items of concern. And uh, the EU uh, began a a process of reviewing Cambodia. As I said, this is the first time they've done this suspension uh, procedure. Uh, we actually represented uh, the. Uh, Cambodian garment manufacturers and footwear producers and bicycle producers in the EBA procedure in Brussels. Um, so again, happy to talk in more detail to anybody um, that's interested in, in what's going on with Cambodia. Um, the, the review ended up with a determination in February of this year uh, to to, as I said, to reduce $1 billion of eligibility. Um, we are still involved in the process of trying to engage uh, the European Union to postpone that decision um, and working with uh, European interests on that. Um, wouldn't say that I'm overly optimistic, but I think there's a very strong case that the European Union did not anticipate the impact of the pandemic in COVID-19 on Cambodia when they made this decision. So they would really, should really want to assess it uh, further before moving forward. So we'll have to see um, what happens with that. Um, but that's, it's basically driven by the decision of the prime minister to, to illegalize the political opposition and to shut down certain newspapers uh, and NGOs. But as you, you all know, Cambodia has a very robust um, labor compliance history uh, uh, for the sector with working with the ILO. Next slide, Rich. Um, Bangladesh, there was also a, what they call an you know, enhanced uh, engagement with Bangladesh on labor rights concerns uh, that came out of a lot of the issues that you're well aware of. Um, that had not gone to a full scale investigation uh, of course, Bangladesh is a much more important supplier to, to the European Union than Cambodia is, although Cam the European Union is a, a bigger um, market than North America is for Cambodia, um, and that's based on EBA. Um, but the European Union kind of um, sort of suspended further engagement on this uh, with, with the COVID uh, situation, and they have not yet indicated uh, what the next step will be. So there is ongoing concern and arguments that, well, if, if they reviewed uh, Cambodia, they should review Bangladesh. Next slide, Rich. Very similar arguments made with regard to Myanmar. Um, they've also had an enhanced engagement process. They've had a number of monitoring missions uh, that was kind of uh, interrupted by the COVID process. But obviously, the situation with Rohingya uh, plays significantly in any de decision that they might make about next steps with Myanmar. So both Bangladesh and Myanmar remain um, potentially subject to EBA withdrawal reviews, although um, I don't expect that in, in the near term. Um, next slide, Rich. One, one, a couple of last points on what's going on in, in Brussels that might be of interest. And we do have uh, a presence, you know, a full-time presence in Brussels. 
uh, as we do in, in New Delhi. So if, if you're interested, particularly in what's happening in European Union, again, happy to, to follow up with anybody on that. But you should be aware that there's a number of pretty aggressive initiatives in the European Union that have been announced by this, uh, this commission as priorities, including the mandatory due diligence initiative, which would um, basically take OECD due diligence guidelines and other potential guidelines and make them into legislate, legislation, so make them mandatory. Um, that's being worked on. Uh, and we expect to see a proposal out of the commission by next year on that. We also expect to see a modification to the non-financial reporting directive uh, next year. And there's also, they're working on an action plan on sustainable finance. All of these could become mandatory um, obligations on companies operating within the European Union, quite si significant initiatives. Also worth mentioning, you know, they're, they're looking at a carbon border tax. Uh, some of you may recall, and we've talked about they can't do trade agreements with uh, countries that aren't adhering to the, the Paris climate obligations as well. Um, so, uh, and this fits in with the Green Deal, which has a lot of political momentum in Europe. Uh, last slide, Rich, for me. Um, and of course that comes on top of the circular economy action plan that's been adopted uh, just recently, as well as there's a big push in the European Union uh, to be more aggressive on the enforcement of their uh, sustainability obligations, labor environment and their trade agreements, uh, as well as the potential to even take trade actions, uh, dumping cases, uh, related to those issues. We just saw the European Union did something very novel in, in countervailing imposing penalty duties on products coming from Egypt that had received uh, uh, subsidies from China. From China. So um, they, they've said, well, uh, China, if, if China's giving a subsidy to a third country, then that, that can become a, a countervailable subsidy. So it can be quite uh, a lot more aggressive on some of these trade actions and trade actions that may relate to some of these labor sustainability issues going forward. Let me stop there. I think this was a slide that Ron was referring to in terms of FTA partners. So we can move to Emily's presentation. All right. Uh, thanks so much for having me join today. I'm going to keep it quick so that we have a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, so to start with, back to the, the discussion about COVID-19 and our challenges, you know, uh, the timeline and impacts that Andrew shared earlier on in the presentation really reflected some of the experiences that Columbia faced. Um, so, you know, we had kind of the early signs of supply chain impact after the Chinese New Year, Lunar New Year holiday, where we were seeing that our raw material suppliers in China were, were having a prolonged holiday. So that was kind of the beginning of it. Um, so we had to make some quick changes to, you know, find some agility in um, our raw material source base to start, and then it kind of creeped into to finish good manufacturing, you know, in all the countries that we that we manufacture in. Should also say that we also had to contend with retail closures around the world and in China. So we actually had to, you know take our current book of orders and what was either on the water or about to ship, about to be out of the factory and kind of divert that, that supply. Um, so we're kind of a, are still working through that exercise of moving our existing to su supply to where there's more exposure and um, um, play outlets to sell basically. So then after that, we of course experienced more waves of country closures you know, impacting our finished goods manufacturers, like I said. There was also actually a pretty big surge in shipping costs, especially air freight. So any of you who deal with, with the actual shipping side of things, air freight went up something like 300% for a period of time. Um, we also uh, we also participated in a duty deferral efforts to defer duty payments for, for a period of time. Um, however, the way that it was handled was um, a little bit difficult to deal with. So there were limitations on 
you know, who could apply for it, um, what kind of impacts you face as a business. Um, and then they gave us less than 24 hours to, to get it done. So, you know, um, customs workers actually weren't prepared for, for dealing with the duty deferral. So that's cash flow that would have helped our business in a way. So, um, that was, that was kind of problematic, but we're, we were able to take advantage, advantage of one month of duty deferral. Uh, we also face retail closures worldwide and we're still, you know, we're, we're opening stores again. However, um, you know, the, we'll see kind of what happens with kind of the surge of um, disease outbreak yet again. But we also had a lot of incoming out inventory that that um, didn't have a, a place to go. So we're kind of dealing with with um, some capacity issues at our distribution centers. Um, next slide, Rich. So some of our, we've done many things, but these are some of the things that we kind of did to, to respond to the crisis. Um, we really shifted our, shift our, our focus to e-commerce and thanks, thank goodness for the internet at this period of time. Um, we really focus a lot on building more agility into our source base, not just um, finished good manufacturers, but raw materials. And then that kind of sped up some of our strategic sourcing endeavors and um, focus on trade opportunities. Uh, we also kind of looked at, you know, our seasons and um, I think we tried to streamline the product offerings for the next couple of seasons and then a huge endeavor to reallocate our orders worldwide. Next slide. On the trade policy front, I think these were kind of touched on, but we really do, we work a lot with the Outdoor Industry Association on our trade policy efforts. Um, so. We support um, OIA's GSP reform, um, and we actually work with them on miscellaneous tariff bill as well. So that's a good opportunity for anyone who hasn't participated in that. We're midstream with that right now for the next round, but this is something to kind of participate in and, and pay attention to in the future. Uh, we're also um, strong supporters of reforming the Section 321 um, clause uh, and being able to use that out of foreign trade zones. Um, some of the challenges that we face that kind of Rich touched on were GSP expiration is a big concern for us um, and as well as the India and Indonesia 301 investigations, which I'm glad to hear that Indonesia might be, you know, cooperating. So that's great to hear. Um, we, like I said, the lack of duty deferral relief in the early months of the COVID crisis was problematic for us. And of course, we're concerned with the continued China tariffs. Next slide. Some of the global trade opportunities that we utilize as a company. So we've been using the CPTPP since its ratification at the end of 2018. Um, mostly it's uh, Vietnam manufacturing going into Canada. Um, and we're, you know, we're working to expand that into our other um, countries as well. Uh, so Canada apparel and footwear imports will be at zero duty if they, if they qualify by next year. The rules of origin are actually based on um, the needs of U.S. manufacturer or U.S. industry, so it's a yarn forward rule with some really um, complex things to kind of pay attention to. So, as Rich mentioned earlier, or not Rich, Ron mentioned earlier, the devil is in the details with this, so you really have to um, know your product really well. We also are poised to take advantage of the EU Vietnam once it goes into effect. Um, the one thing I would point out here for apparel manufacturers is that it's actually quite a long phase out for active apparel. Um, so there's not a lot of opportunity for duty free uh, in the immediate, um, but it's more of like a four to eight year phase out of tariffs. So actually for the first year, there's some products that would be more beneficial to, to maintain the GSP duty reduction than um, going in and using the EVFTA right away. It is a fabric forward um, uh, agreement for apparel, so it makes it a little bit simpler to use than the CPTPP. Uh, next slide. And then I'll just leave this here. This is to the EU GSP. Um, they're kind of, we use all three tiers of this and um, the standard GSP and GSP plus are fabric forward with um, some non-originating rules. Um, and then the EBA is actually cut and sew from any origin. And I would also point out that there's regional accumulation um, within this. So if you're manufacturing in India, you can you can 
um, use textiles from um, from the group three, for example, but you couldn't bring something in from, from Vietnam. I'll turn it over to Rich for the last minute. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. No, thank you, Ron, Andrew, and Emily. Um, clearly, we have a lot to go over with everyone, and uh, we probably could have used an, another hour or so, but just we have time for a couple of questions. And any follow-up questions, please do reach out to me at rharbordoutdoorindustry.org. Um, and you can also sign up for trade alerts. There's some information on Twitter. Um, but just quickly, a you know, uh, couple quick questions. We're small, medium-sized business. For uh, sorry, for small and medium-sized businesses, uh, you know, looking to diversify, get out of China. What's what some of our first steps to explore? Um, you know, some sourcing options that you mentioned for you know either apparel uh, or footwear. Um, I guess the question is, or where do we begin um, if we're looking to uh, move out of China? Ron, and that's a lot to go over, but do you have any some additional thoughts? Where does a small sure. business start? Yeah, yeah. One thing I suggest is, and again, depending on how your level of familiarity with uh, um, international sourcing, is look at the trade data, and, and and that can be provided through OIA or you can. There's various government websites, but to look at where is the trade coming in from now, um, in the product categories you care about. Um, secondly, look to see if there's a free trade or preferential program. Um, and third, reach out to OIA because you know we can help you target uh, associations or specific companies in various countries that you identify as potential. Um, and you know, there's going to be countries that are going to be easier for small and medium-sized business uh, companies to source from. Some factories will want to deal with just the big guys and want to have huge volume. So we can help you wind through that. Um, Emily, one thanks, Ron. Emily, one for you. Have you has Columbia already started looking at uh, planning for, you know, potentially a second COVID-19 wave in the fall and how that might impact uh, your supply chains and business planning? I mean, we, I don't think we've gotten out of planning mode per se. Um, yeah, we're, we have to pay really close attention to that. Um, we're, we're monitoring country closures, manufacturing closures constantly. So, yeah, um, I think that's really, you know, this crisis is really kind of put a focus on, you know, becoming more agile. And I think that that, you know, the first wave kind of set us in motion for that. And having alternate sourcing options um, and kind of weaving that into our supply chain a little more um, concretely. And I would maybe, I would add to that, you know, I think just given the interest in this webinar, um, you know, I think there'll be ample opportunity for other OIA presentations with, you know, key members that, you know, they can discuss, you know, what, what steps they're taking. Um, so you've heard from Emily today, and I think there could be other opportunities moving forward. Um, okay, we've got time for one more, and I wish we could get to more, but again, reach out to me at rharbordoutdoorindustry.org, um, you know, for any other questions. I mean, we can address them in the follow-up to this presentation. We'll get you a copy of the slides um, and, and, the, and the webinar. Um, <laughs> I guess so. What would we need to see uh, from China um, to secure a lifting of the punitive tariffs? I guess maybe I mean, there might be two ways to answer that question. If it's a Trump two administration or Biden one administration, what do we need to see from the Chinese? Ron, do you want to tackle that one? You know, the U.S.-China relationship has become a lot more complex, and 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 the issues are broader than trade. But on the trade front. Clearly, you know, China, number one, has to meet the commitments of the phase one deal and meet those purchasing commitments on U.S. agriculture and other products. But secondly, they have to be prepared to get to deal with the structural reform that's necessary um, to allow U.S. companies fair access to the market for investing and, 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 and exporting to um, and protection of intellectual property rights. So it's still there's still a long way to go on the negotiations. You know, increasingly things like Huawei and security issues are are, are being brought up, um, and those are going to be very important in the overall conversation. I think, Rich, as you said, um, regardless of who the next president is, um, I think we're looking at a year plus of pretty intensive negotiations before you could possibly see um, 
you know, revocation of the existing punitive tariffs. And I think that's even a bit optimistic. Okay, well, we're gonna have to end it there. And I apologize, wish I had time for more questions, um, but we will follow up to each person that registered for the webinar with a copy of the slides. We'll have a recording uh, of the presentation. Please don't hesitate to follow up with uh, any other uh, additional questions. Um, so with that, uh, thank you very much. And we look forward to uh, the next trade uh, webinar. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Rich.